it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today um, our guest speaker, Sarah Scaturo, who's coming to us from the Cleveland Museum of Art, where she's the head of conservation. And she will, I believe, give you a little bit about her background so you will have all of that information yourself. Um, so this is, we are very excited to have her come all the way um, to be joining us now in Northeast Ohio. Um, and so she will be giving a little bit of a talk about um, conservation at the Costume Institute, where she had the honor of being conservator for many years. Um, but I will um, hand this off to, to another Sarah. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, can I get a note in the chat if you can hear me and also see the screen? That would be great. And I, I have a yes. Let me see here. Yes. OK, great. All right. Thank you all so much for your patience. And thank you as well for inviting me here today. Um, I think the camera's a little low, but oh, look, I can oh, raise it up. Um, all right, so hello, my name is Sarah Scaturo, and um, I would like to really thank you, Sarah Rogers, for your invitation to speak tonight, and um, Dr. Christopher P. Sullivan for your support of this lecture series. Um, for you out there on the internet, they are actually here today. Well, Sarah's not, but Dr. Sullivan is here today um, in uh, the auditorium here at KSU. So I am really, really grateful um, for the leadership at the Cleveland Museum of Art, especially my manager, Heather Lamonides Brown, for her continued support of my doctoral research. And this research has been funded by the Center for Craft, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Art Graduate Center, and the Foundation for the Advancement in Conservation. So tonight, I'm honored to present KSU's annual Jean Drusadau Endowed Lecture for Costume and Textile Conservation. And I must admit, Jean Drusadau is something of a hero to me. And yes, she is out there in the <laughs> auditorium. Um, you know, I have known of Jean's legacy and impacts on the field ever since I was a student studying at the Fashion Institute of Technology. I'm also grateful to Jean for her generosity in answering so many of my questions that I had about the Costume Institute and really helping me close the loop on some of these things. So one of the reasons I was drawn to Northeast Ohio uh, was that I understood that even though I might be leaving a center for fashion museology in New York City, I was not exactly heading to a fashion desert. Indeed, the collections at Kent State and the Western Reserve Historical Society were big draws for me. I understood that if KSU could attract serious fashion scholars like Stella Blum and Jean and others, like Sarah Hume and Sarah Rogers, that I was going somewhere significant. So the topic of my talk tonight is how conservation and preservation came about at the Costume Institute. But before I do that, um, I wanted to give you some background about me, kind of like my origin story, um, and tell you a little bit about my dissertation research and a few notes um, on terminology that I'm going to be using before I launch into the Costume Institute's history and the emergence of a professionalized form of conservation. <clears throat> it says, oh, I'm just looking at something. It says, can you switch the pre presenter's view? We are seeing Sarah's view with preview of next slide. Um, how about that? Is that better? Can somebody message me? <clears throat> yeah, all right. OK, thanks so much for the chatting. Um, we're all on the go. It's great. OK, so about me. <laughs> um, so one of the most common questions I get is how I arrived to where I'm at. And so here's just a little bit about me. So I'm originally from Colorado, which is the land of the anti-fashion known as fleece and Birkenstocks. Didn't really know much about fashion growing up. 
I went to undergrad at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and I studied history and Italian. And then after graduation, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to travel at least. And so I moved to Japan to teach English as a second language. And it was there that I became really aware of the power of fashion. I mean, the, the street fashion there is absolutely incredible. So after about a year and a half, I moved to New York City primarily for love, and also I had no idea what I was gonna do. And I found work at an educational nonprofit. So by my mid, my, my late, 20s, I was kind of lost, and I was looking around at graduate programs, and I found the Fashion and Textile Studies program at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and it required chemistry, art studio, or I'm sorry, studio art, art history, and languages. And would you know it, I miraculously had all of those prerequisites. In some way, the program seemed made for me. So after graduating, I began working at the Smithsonian Institution at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. And I was the, both the textile conservator there, and then I eventually also added on the title of fashion curator. So the Costume Institute called me in 2011, asking me to apply for the job as their conservator. And at the time, there was only one full-time permanent conservator position in the department, and it would be that position that I was applying for. So I was at the Costume Institute from 2012 to 2020, and under my tenure, I grew the department from myself to five full-time permanent conservators. And I also had the opportunity to lead the conservation programs for some of the Met's most popular exhibitions, including China Through the Looking Glass and Heavenly Bodies, Fashion and the Catholic Imagination. But when the Cleveland Museum of Art called me about their chief conservator position, I was immediately intrigued and decided to come take a look. And for anybody who has seen the facilities, you know that the Cleveland Museum of Art's conservation department and the museum itself is a very special place. It's absolutely beautiful. I work with an incredible team of conservators and technicians, and we get to work with some of the best art in the world. So I accepted the job without hesitation when I was offered it. And I moved here in April 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. Even with all of the upsets that the pandemic has brought, I feel fortunate to be working in such a supportive environment at CMA. So during my time at the Met, yeah, come on in, <laughs> no problem. During my time at the Met, I entered the doctoral program at the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. BGC offers a unique program that, studio, um, that studies objects of all kinds. And actually, a lot of fashion historians find themselves there since the academic study of fashion, even to this day, is not very well supported at most universities. My focus bridged the theory and history of three areas, conservation, fashion, and museums. My dissertation looks at the development of costume conservation in the United States and Britain during the mid to late 20th century. It brings together a history of the development of dress studies and textile conservation to land on this nexus of costume conservation, which is a specialized discipline that has its own unique set of issues and solutions. And so costume conservation is what I'm going to be talking to you today about. So now that I've given you a little bit of background about my history and research, I want to spend just a moment on defining what I mean when I say conservation, preservation, and restoration. So first, don't be shy. Are any of you out there aware of these terms and maybe the subtle differences between them? Any hands? I won't call on you. No. Okay, <laughs> okay a few. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah, so the terms are really closely linked, but not quite identical. Conservation is the overarching term for the act of keeping artifacts safe for future generations. So this encompasses all sorts of activities, including examination, treatment, and the safe display and storage of artifacts. Preservation aims to keep objects as they are through controlling the environment whether that might be through maintaining a stable temperature or by limiting light or many other actions aimed at preventing damage. So actually another name for preservation that we sometimes use is preventive conservation. Now restoration involves changing the current state of an object in some way so that it looks closer to how it originally did. So as you can see, conservation 
involves both preservation and restoration processes, among a lot of other things. I would also be remiss to, not also, um, to also not say just a few words about the terms costume, fashion, and dress. Now, there can be multiple dissertations and books on this issue alone. So in very short um, you know, description, costume in a museological sense refers to historical garments. The term costume is not used so much anymore um, since the more common meaning today is clothing that is worn on the stage or in the movies or on Halloween. Fashion is attire that is considered fashionable at a specific time and place, and it applies a phenomenon that is based on novelty and change. And dress implies anything and everything that people use to adorn themselves. And this can include things like tattoos, hairstyles, and accessories. So dress is the broadest term um, to describe what people wear. And in general, this is a term that is used more in the UK than it is in the US. So for our purposes tonight, just please note that although there are these differences, I'm probably going to be using these terms pretty interchangeably. So don't get confused. All right, I'm just going to pause and see how everything is out in digital land. It seems like, OK, no, no questions or chats or anything. All right. So let me see where I am. OK, here we go. So tonight I'm focusing on the history of conservation at the Costume Institute. For my title, I've borrowed the phrase, the intuitive approach from Betty Kirk, who was a contract conservator at the Costume Institute in the 1970s. And she went on to become the senior conservator at the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology, as well as a professor in FIT's Costume and Museum Studies graduate program, which began in 1983. So she writes this article for the Costume Society of America's journal Dress, in which she honors her mentor, Elizabeth Lawrence, who was the CI's first conservator and a founder of the field of costume conservation. So the phrase, the intuitive approach that Kirk uses to describe Lawrence's approach is important because it establishes how conservation at the Costume Institute developed through intuition and evidence-based learning rather than through applying hard science. So I was inspired to focus on how conservation emerged at the Costume Institute as I've come across concerns about the quality of the preservation work that Costume Institute staff carried out before the university trained conservators arrived in the late 1980s. In several con conversations I've had with senior scholars in the field, there's a sense that the conservation coming out of the CI was improper or ill-informed. Objects were supposedly damaged, put in danger, and over-restored. Much of the hands-on work was carried out by volunteers. In fact, this perception that CI staff had no idea what they were doing with regards to conservation is even asserted by the Met itself and even today. A 2020 online essay called Caring for the Met, 150 Years of Conservation states, and I quote, when the first professional fashion conservators were engaged in the late 1980s, they found the collections in the hands of skilled conservators, or I'm sorry, hands of skilled sewers, women who had worked in the garment industry or the theater with no understanding of conservation principles. I have folded this last part, which I believe is untrue. The staff at the Costume Institute overwhelmingly knew what they were doing. One of the reasons that some people did not see the CI staff as professionals is because of the domestic paradigm. So what do I mean by that? And can I ask everybody to mute out there? I think we're getting a little bit of um, buzzing. OK, thank you. So what do I mean by the phrase, the domestic paradigm? So this is the concept that textile conservation is just a fancy word for general household maintenance. For example, clothes are mended and laundered, and the preservation approach involves housekeeping and maintaining cupboards. This connection of textile conservation to women's work is real. Even textile conservators recognize that their work might not be as automatically valued as, say, the work of their fellow paintings conservators because of the value of the objects themselves. Textiles are often lower valued than other kinds of materials, both monetarily and in the art historical hierarchy. 
So in this presentation today, I challenge the perception that the conservation that was happening at the Costume Institute was unskilled and uninformed. Instead, I contend that the Costume Institute's conservation program up through the 1980s was developed by women applying embodied knowledge gleaned from their own industry and museum experiences and informed by practical domestic concerns. Yes, the domestic. While science was present in the kind of conservation at the, um, that reigned at the Costume Institute, it was truly the empirical and intuitive approach that was dominant. So now, oh, I'd say, oh, and I have a comment here, a bit insulting, I would say, about the domestic paradigm. I agree, Meg, the conservator out there. <laughs> So um, now I'd like to give you a brief overview of the CI's history, its curatorial and conservation leadership, and then I will move on to discussing case studies that reflect the CI's attention to conservation principles. So the department first started as a separate organization called the Museum of Costume Art in 1937. I'm going really quickly here about their history too. It joined the Met in 1946 and was renamed the Costume Institute. It had its own board of directors and was required to be self-sufficient. This is where the party of the year fundraiser begins. It became a curatorial department in 1959. Um, I don't know who's, somebody is very loud. Can I ask you all to mute? I'm muting somebody. Okay, I think I got them. All right, great. Okay. So back to where I'm at. I'm going pretty quickly through the history of the Costume Institute. So in 1946, it joins the Met. It is still its own kind of entity within the Met. And it finally merges completely with the Met in 1959, when all operations were taken over finally by the Met. But crucially, and this is important even to this day, the CI was still required to raise its own uh, operating budget. So this is why the Met Gala happens every year. It actually goes to support the operating costs of the department. So the department has gone through several renovations that I note here, and they're all paid for by the party of the year. So very quickly, here is the um, Costume Institute leadership. And for purposes tonight, I'm only going to be mentioning or talking about a few of them, and I've put them in bold. So the first person I really want to um, call out and who I'll be talking a lot about tonight is Polaire Weissman, who was its executive director um, for quite a while um, at, the, at the Met, but she actually had a 50-year tenure. I mean, she was there a significant amount of time, and it was really her, um, as I'll, I'll be discussing, that determines a lot of the conservation protocols that the Costume Institute to this day still uses. The next person I want to mention is Stella Blum, who, of course, was the uh, founding director and curator in charge here at Kent State. She, um, although she has only kind of a shorter tenure as the curator in charge at the Costume Institute, she had actually been at the Met at the Costume Institute since 1940. Um, so she has a long history with um, the, well, when it was the Museum of Costume Art and then when it merged with the Met. And then I am also going to mention Diana Vreeland, who um, was never actually in charge of the Costume Institute. She was a contract, or a contract curator, but of course she had an immense impact on the kinds of exhibitions. Bars, we want my formal <laughs> All right. Bars, do I don't know who that is. Let me see. Can everybody mute? Okay, I think we're good. All right. All right, here we go again. Okay, and then last but definitely not least, we have Jean, who is out there. Hi, Jean. <laughs> um, so, okay, moving on. So this slide has taken me um, actually kind of a while to compile this information because this history isn't written anywhere, which is why I'm trying to write it myself. So I was looking at who were the leaders of conservation at the Costume Institute, because um, you just don't read about them, you don't hear about them. And um, this is the list that I've been able to compile with the knowledge that I have. Of course, if anybody has additional information, I'm always open to hearing it. But as you can see, I do include Weissman, because she oversaw conservation as a fundamental part of her curatorial remit 
And she functioned as the de facto conservator for her, time, for her tenure. Um, and in fact, there was no real textile conservator at the Met Museum until 1966. And the Department of Textile Conservation didn't even develop until the 70s. All textile conservation done prior to this was either outsourced or done internally by the curatorial staff and volunteers. Elizabeth Lawrence, who you see here, was the first conservator appointed by the CI from 1970 until her death in 1982, after which time Judith Trudy was appointed. And it's only with the arrival of Kara Varnell in 1988, who had a blended training, which included both apprenticeship, so on the job learning, as well as coursework, that the CI hired its first, um, what we consider program trained conservator. However, Varnell didn't really want the job. She only wanted it temporarily. And, and so she just essentially was there kind of holding down the fort until a permanent conservator could be hired, which happened in 1989 with Chris Polachek. So Chris was the first fully program trained conservator at the Costume Institute. And as you see, I was the second program trained conservator to oversee the lab. And my former colleague, Glenn Peterson, valiantly holds down the fort while they continue to search for my replacement. So Costume Institute staff look to their conservation colleagues for additional guidance on how best to preserve and conserve their collection. And here I'm just going to point out two names. Murray Pease, he was very influential in the field of conservation, and he wrote our first code of ethics. So conservation um, is grounded on ethics, and it, it, it guides everything that we do. And so he was responsible for the first um, version in the US. And then I also want to point out Nobuko Kajitani. So she founded the Department of Textile Conservation at the Met in 1973, and she is perhaps historically the most influential textile conservator in the United States, at least in my opinion. So now I'm going to move on to the case studies. Yay! So while not an exhaustive list, the CI staff holistically approached the conservation of their collection through addressing these areas. So I'm just going to go through each of these and give you some great examples. So the foundational goal of the costume collection in its first few decades was that it would be shared with fashion and costume designers, students and scholars as a source of inspiration and knowledge. So this concept was ultimately called the live study storage system, which was organized on the model of a reference library. So that meant that from the onset, visitors were allowed to handle and take patterns from garments, mount them onto a dress form, or even a live model like you see here. And members, which were those who paid a fee for special access, were even allowed to check them out. So this prioritization on collection access helped legitimize the usefulness of the collection. It was doing a service to the industry, and so the industry was expected to provide fiscal support in return through the party of the year. From um, the, this progress report dating from the early 1960s states, quote, the Costume Institute has been responsible for a number of innovations that have been widely adapted by other museums. One of these, the live study method of sorting the collections, functions on the principle of a reference library. Every item is cataloged and ready at hand. Nothing is buried. Each garment is within a minute's reach. So while the mission of the Costume Institute was to allow as much access as possible, staff recognized early on that too much handling of objects was detrimental. In 1949, at a meeting of the CI's advisory committee, Polaire Weissman advocated for the creation of Muslim patterns to preserve the collection, suggesting that students could study these instead of handling the original garments. Balancing access with preservation was critical and Weissman sought this balance by designing a special hanger. Now, come, you know, bear with me. A hanger might seem pretty basic, but this is a really great hanger. And proper hanging is one of the most important preventive measures taken to preserve costume. And Polaire Weissman recognized this from the outset. So, for example, early padded hangers like those we still use today were created since they support shoulders better and minimize fabric distortion and damage. But Weissman didn't stop just there. The first hint of a special hanger occurs in a brochure for the Museum of Costume Arts first exhibition in 1939. It mentions the study storage, 
and emphasizes that, quote, the hangars have been specially designed by Polar Weissman to facilitate the preservation and handling of the costumes, end quote. So we finally get a sense of the, this hangar in the 1946 photo where we see a pole extending from the neck with a hook at the end. Importantly, the dresses look as if they have additional padding or support throughout the torso, as if they've been mounted already. And in fact, what we have seen is this. The design was published in a 1948 manual written by the Mets Registrar with the accompanying text stating, quote, a special type of hanger has been devised by Miss Polair Weissman at the Costume Institute, which affords greater protection to costumes and long-term storage than do the conventional narrow dress hangers, end quote. So this special hanger shows that by the 1940s, there was a sophisticated understanding of the spatial and physical complexities of costume and the need to manage its weight, distortion, and handling over time. The goals of the special hanger were to provide support at areas of inherent weaknesses, so the shoulders, the waist, the hips, provide shaping so that the garment silhouette is discernible, facilitate easy study as the hanger can be moved from the hanging from hanging on a rack to being secured to a floor plate so that it can be viewed up close and in the round, and of course, to limit handling. So this hanger was able to do all of that while still ensuring access to the object. And the hanger maintained its usefulness for many decades and was an invention that was adopted by other museums, including Colonial Williamsburg. The museum's archive has, um, the Met Museum's archive has several sketches made in 1961 of this hanger, which showed minimal changes made to the design. And even by my time at the CI, there were still a few of these hangers in existence, although they were finally being completely phased out. At the time, I had no idea where they had come from, and neither did my predecessor, Chris Polachek. Stella Blum discussed this hanger at the 1980 ICOM meeting in Mexico City. She stated, quote, it was a wonderful concept, but we discovered after years of use that it had some inherent weaknesses. One was that the wire eventually works through, and after a period of time, this will injure a costume. Also, the rigidity of the frame sometimes caused distortion in the silhouette. However, we still have some of these hangers in use, as we have not as yet devised anything better for hanging the extremely heavy bustle skirts of the 1870s and 1880s, which would not fit easily into drawers. And if I can ask everybody to please um, also mute again out there, um, we're getting some feedback. All right, thank you. All right, Stella Blum would go on to say, quote, it would be a good project for someone to pick up and develop one stage further using plastic instead of metal. And indeed, although at the time I did not know this was Blum's wish for the hanger, during my tenure as head conservator, we used 3D scanning and CNC routing to create invisible archival ethophone mounts that served storage, study, and display functions while also limiting handle while providing access, just like the special hanger could. So in 1967, the Costume Institute underwent a long-awaited storage renovation planned by Polar Weissman and based on lessons learned during the previous 30 years. The plan would enlarge the department to twice its size, integrate functions, install new lighting, air conditioning, and filtration, and create new storage units. And it would cost around $5 million. Again, all paid for by the party of the year. Progress on the renovation was slow and frustrating. First, the plan as envisioned provided practically no room for growth, and there was no place in the plan to store such unaccessioned materials as mannequins, standards, and et cetera. And for those of you who work in fashion museums, you know that these space concerns are still very relevant today. Additionally, the renovation was delayed because the museum incorporated the project into a larger renovation of the museum's north wing. But finally, the department closed for renovation, and there were no CI exhibitions from 1967 until 19, um, 1971 when it reopened. And here's the layout when it reopened, with galleries marked in orange, conservation in green, and storage in blue. At the time, there were about 17,000 objects in the collection, with the department occupying a 45,000 square foot area with 10 permanent collections. Sadly, Weissman ended up retiring in the middle of the renovation, 
leaving the last details to Adolf Cavallo, who was the chairman of the CI from 1970 to 72. Both press and staff celebrated the facilities as the most advanced system to be found anywhere. The environment was kept at 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. Pollution was controlled since the air was scrubbed and new UV filtered lighting and non-aqueous fire protection systems were installed. And here we see the storage units in 1948, which remains the archetype for costume storage even today. All vertical space was utilized by raising metal hanging racks up higher so that another hanging bay or drawers could be placed below. And so with practice, as I'm sure a lot of you know, one realizes that it is easier to retrieve objects stored flat from down below than it is from up above. The dimensions of the racks and drawers were standardized and optimized for the general specifications of costumes, and storage units were modular for flexibility. Note the use of shades to block light and filter dust, and of course, the CI special hanger. So we see that Polaire Weissman had already designed this, you know, right from the get-go. So the 1971 renovation updated the storage units, but essentially kept their same logic. Costumes were kept in the dark, only this time they were shielded by louvered blinds instead of drapes, and storeroom lights were turned off when not in use. New modular units further optimized space while still being custom fit for general dimensions of costume. And although the units were wood, they were sealed with formica paint, which was determined by the Met scientists to be inert and protect from acidic off-gassing. Even all the edges were rounded so that nothing sharp would snag the costumes. Plastic hangers made of polystyrene were also tested by conservation scientists and found to be safe. So in sum, Weissman's impact on the general concept of costume storage as we know it today still prevails. And when the CI's most recent renovation that I helped plan opened in 2014, as you can see, the logic of storage remained the same. It was primarily the materials that were updated using metal for the cabinets instead of wood, along with the installation of compactable storage. So next, I would like to briefly touch upon display as it relates to conservation. There is already a good amount of research out there on Diana Vreeland's impact on display. Her exhibits were evocative and spectacular, featuring colored and abstracted mannequins. She rejected the natural in favor for the artificial and fantastical, opting for extreme styling, gestures, and props. But there is little research on how staff mounted objects safely, accurately, and beautifully from the CI's inception, or the role that conservation played in achieving Vreeland's lively aesthetic. For example, from the Museum of Costume Art's first exhibition in 1939 under Polaire Weissman's direction, there has been a profound respect for the conservation concept of fitting the mannequin to the dress, not the dress to the mannequin. So notice the back of this dress, which remains unbuttoned because of the mannequin shoulders, which are too wide for the narrow sloped line of the 1830s. Additionally, the CI has always paid attention to achieving the correct silhouette and in fact, since the late 1970s, the Kyoto Costume Institute mannequin has been the primary tool for mounting period costume. And there are actually some still in use out here in the KSU galleries that you can take a look at. Um, the key to this mannequin is its maneuverability and customizability of joints, as well as the waist area, which enables one to determine torso length and circumference. Although it's called the Kyoto Costume Institute or KCI mannequin, it was actually created in a partnership between KCI and the Costume Institute in 1978, when the KCI was actually founded. And so it wouldn't even exist without the guidance of CI staff like Stella Blum and Liz Lawrence. Liz Lawrence helped develop the CI look even before Vreeland's tenure. She was proud of the mannequin she designed, stating, quote, they are aloof, colorless, and abstract, and their shininess gives a wonderful sense of motion to the clothes. She divulged in a newspaper interview how dressing Balenciaga gowns, which you see here, oh, let me go back, which you see here, was difficult because of the placement of the mannequin's dress, uh, the mannequin's breasts, excuse me, not their dress. Yes, she said, we had a general debossoming. So essentially, you know today, if you try to dress a mannequin, the breasts kind of can be a problem sometimes. So she says, we had a general debossoming, and after that, we could put the fabric wherever the dress said to put it. 
She goes on to say, and I quote, the fabric has a memory. The fabric remembers the warmth of the body and the balance of the design. It shows you where it wants to go, end quote. So what do her statements reveal? Her approach certainly means close looking, but it also means understanding that the object had a life before it came to her, and that life itself had left an imprint that affects where the garment gives, where it tightens, where it crumples, and where it's smooth. So to dress a costume it, to its best, you must both research and intuit the shape it needs and wants, while also recognizing and possibly recapturing what its ideal manifestation once was. This means balancing the designer's and wearer's intent with the reality of the garment itself. Lawrence sought freshness and vigor in her costume mounting. Burke, Betty Kirk stated in her 2003 oral history that, quote, Liz's philosophy was that when you put things on an exhibition, they should always look like a fashion plate. Because even if you see women who are wearing the latest fashion and it doesn't look correct, in their mind's image, that's what they're wearing, end quote. And I'm just going to quickly open the chat just to make sure we're all good. OK, we are good with the chat. OK. Um, so let's talk about Liz Lawrence a little more. So she had a profound impact on fashion conservation, even though she started later in her life joining the CI at age 52. According to a press release issued in 1977 upon her promotion to Master Restorer, in 1970, she went for a behind the scenes tour at the CI. Upon her visit, she saw, and I'm quoting, a rare, once magnificent gown being examined, and I asked if I could try to bring it back to its original state. That was Thursday. I started the next Monday and spent four months working on that one dress, end quote. So by the time she came to the CI, she had a significant experience in the fashion industry, first as a buyer and then as an apprentice at Ferguson and Wheelock, which was a top couture house in New York City. And finally, she had opened up her own custom design shop. So she had a discerning eye, excellent hand skills, and she deeply understood fashion. Like many white women who were able to work in the museum with little pay, Lawrence came from a privileged background. She was born in 1918 as a descendant of an elite American family and raised in luxury on Long Island. She attended an expensive private school, Nightingale Bamford, which, as a side note, is the setting of the Gossip Girl series. And we see her here on the right in 1941, around age 23, looking stylish while volunteering to support the British war effort as part of her school's alumni association. And as far as I can find out, she remained unmarried throughout her life. So Lawrence's foundational methods were discussed in the press release issued upon her promotion to Master Restorer in 1977. Um, oh, it says, Somebody says they think my camera is off. Oh, wait, sorry, y'all. Coming down. OK. Doing a lot of things here. All right. Um, all right, let me start this over. Lawrence's foundational methods were discussed in the press release issued upon her promotion to Master Restorer in 1977. And to quote the press release, without previous standards to refer to, she worked out her own methods. Miss Lawrence's tools included a professional steamer with huge bottles of distilled water, a hand vacuum cleaner, bolts of lining silk, and smaller swatches of every kind and color of fabric for cleaning, patching, and appliquing. Each costume problem is carefully studied as to the best and safest methods of restoration." End quote. So from the beginning, the costume collection was repaired and regularly maintained with any, by anyone with sewing skills under the guise of collection upkeep. So before Lawrence, repairs were overseen by curatorial assistants. This job description from 1947 for the assistant to the executive technician, and the executive technician was Polaire Weissman, um, states that they should, quote, do necessary repairs and mending as time permits, end quote. While a part-time worker position sta stated that laundry, pressing, and cleaning the storage rooms was important, along with cleaning platforms and dusting during exhibitions. By the 1970s, the institution also had the position of a housekeeper held by Iria Zimbardo, who performed the role of what today we might call a collections manager. She pulled and put objects away, kept the storerooms clean, and sewed a session tags onto objects. 
Up through the 1980s, much of the actual hands-on conservation and installation work was done by volunteers. Blum and Lawrence had mastered the organization and supervision of the volunteers, never turning anyone away, but rather finding tasks suited to that person's skill level. So if you were excellent at needlework, you stitched. If you weren't, you untangled fringe on shawls. There were strict protocols about what to do and what not to do, all of which are excellent guidelines even today. They start with the strongest admonishment, all in capital letters, never try anything on. That means you, Kim Kardashian. I'll move on. Um, during the 1970s and 80s, the volunteer force at any time could number over 100. For example, Stella Blum's 1978 annual report indicated 60 volunteers spent over 8,000 hours helping Lawrence get objects exhibitable. Given the small staff of the CI, the preparatory work for exhibitions could never have happened without the volunteers' enthusiastic help, tempered by Lawrence's and Blum's steadfast supervision. This gratitude was explicitly stated in the ground rules for volunteers. Quote, we need you, and so far you have more than fulfilled our greatest expectations, end quote. So there are many who have criticized the CI's use of volunteers, stating this was how many objects got damaged. And this may very well be true, as volunteers were seldom turned away. Many significant fashion curators and editors got their start through volunteering, including Harold Coda and Vogue editors Andre Lantelli and Tony Goodman, who you see here. Volunteering also offered a way to cultivate public support and for the volunteers themselves, social capital. We see here a memo from Vreeland stating that even Nan Kempner, a famous socialite, was happy to volunteer. And eventually she actually ended up donating her collection of couture to the CI. It's a pretty fantastic collection. Reliance on volunteers was not unique to the Costume Institute. For example, the de Young Museum in San Francisco used a team of 70 volunteers to treat tapestries for a 1976 exhibition. And about 95% of the work was uh, completed by volunteers. The museum, their museum, didn't even hire their first textile conservator until 1976. The use of volunteers was seen as so necessary and obvious to fulfill the significant hours of labor required to conserve textiles that even Karen Finch, who founded one of the first graduate programs in textile conservation, uh, it was located in the UK, published best protocols for managing volunteers, especially for large scale projects. A reliance on volunteers is a double-edged sword um, that I am investigating further in my dissertation. There are many good aspects of volunteering. It enabled access into the conservation field and engendered goodwill among the public and patrons, as well as getting very much necessary work done. But at the same time, it possibly devalued professional conservation expertise. Although self-taught, Lawrence was careful, effective, and skilled. She had a profound respect for conservation, and most importantly, she knew her limits regarding science. She was guided by her intuition, embodied experience, and desire to do well by the objects. Her treatment goals were to address shattered fabrics, minimize wrinkles, mask and prevent damage, clean soiling and stains, and stabilize seams and elements. Her stabilization treatments were primarily stitched. She did not use adhesives. So Stella Blum explained the CI's approach succinctly for the New York Times a year after Lawrence passed away. She said, we restore only up to the point where pure reproduction begins. If we did not, our shows would be filled with little more than dresses with broken armholes. So this 1864 gown by the master French couturier Pingat had a typical Lawrence treatment. It was largely in good condition, but had issues with stains, rotting silk net, and alterations to the skirt. Sorry, it's not moving. Here we go. For the bodice, she restored all the net trim since the original had mostly rotted away. She retained the remaining original fabric in situ, covering it in new net, which had been dyed with tea. She often used nylon net since it lasted longer than silk. And these fabrics were purchased directly from commercial stores in already dyed colors that were adjusted if needed. This showed pragmatism, as custom dyeing compensation fabrics can take a few days, 
which might not be practical or possible given available resources. For the skirt, she removed later alterations to its pleating to restore the original silhouette and used short hits of steam to remove the alteration pleat lines. She noted that the steam also restored the texture of the silk. Lastly, she concealed a large stain using a strategic stitch, stitch fabric overlay to knock back the discoloration. So just, she didn't try to remove the stain itself, she just covered it up with some fabric. This kind of restoration in which one takes an object back to an earlier state um, is not done lightly, but in this case it was done because Lawrence had the skill and there was enough evidence and material to guide her. And of course, she didn't go it alone, she did it in consultation with the curator. The treatment that Betty Kirk published in her 1982 article, The Intuitive Approach to Restoration, a tribute to Elizabeth Lawrence, demonstrates Lawrence's influence and, co um, and covers a treatment that Kirk did, also to another Pingat gown. So a lot of Pingat tonight. Kirk was trained by Lawrence, but they had earlier worked together in the fashion industry. Kirk had impressive skills and is best known today for her reverse engineering of Madeleine Viennet's designs. In the article, she discusses the intuitive approach, telling how Lawrence had instructed her by saying, quote, you must get into the mind of the designer, end quote. She needed to, quote, look for the clues, see the memory of the fabric, and let the dress tell you what it wants done to it, end quote. Kirk's treatment started by stabilizing and replacing disintegrating tool on the bodice with nylon net. She removed what was left of the pattering net to take a pattern. She noticed how there was almost no fabric left to begin with, and that what remained had crumbled into dust by the time she had finished her pattern. And this might seem alarming, and it is, but it's also a reality that a silk tool powders away with movement and time, that her pattern was possibly the last chance one had to obtain the original form of the embellishment, since any further handling for study or exhibition would continue to destroy it and it would continue to decay in storage. We still must make these kinds of difficult decisions today, as there are some fabrics that we cannot save, no matter how hard we try. While she considered the bodice treatment to be straightforward, Kirk wasn't certain how best to treat the skirt. She conducted research, made tests, but then finally paused and put the skirt away to continue to think. As she made a list of known facts and the logic of construction, she finally began to understand how Pingott had approached the design. Her solution, which was a bow in the back, satisfied all clues that she had found. So to our eyes today, the garments, oh, I'm sorry, there we go. To our eyes today, the garments treated by Lawrence and Kirk might seem over restored. Today, I would use natural fabrics instead of synthetics, and I would aim to give the trimming a softness rather than being so crisp and voluminous. I might not replicate the bow unless I was certain what exactly it had looked like. But the reasoning behind their treatments is ultimately the same as mine would be. I want to render the garments exhibitable. I want to make the garments look the best they can while stabilizing them and retaining as much authenticity as possible. But I also do want them to exude freshness and fashionability. In Lawrence's words, quote, fashionable garments radiate freshness and excitement. No one should have to look at costumes that are flaccid, dreary distortions of what, they want, of what they once were, end quote. So Lawrence passed away in 1982 after a short and private illness, probably lung cancer after a lifetime of smoking. Stella Blum and Lawrence had a particularly close relationship, and Blum stated upon Lawrence's death, quote, just as she shared her friendship, she shared her unique knowledge of costume conservation and restoration. And quite literally, her contributions have influenced all the major costume collections, both here and abroad, end quote. So after Lawrence's death, Bloom hired, Blum hired Judith Jurdy to replace Lawrence. Jurdy had been a volunteer for a moment at the CI and lived in Minnesota. She was tall, slim, and had a stunning head of red hair. Can't find an actual photo of her, unfortunately. She had an MA in art history and taught art history and costume design while also taking on freelance projects as a conservator and exhibition installer. Her incoming title at the Costume Institute was assistant conservator, but she didn't have any formal university or apprenticeship training nor industry experience. 
And the sketch you see here comes from a book that Jody wrote that is a fictionalized tale about her life at the Costume Institute and in Minnesota. In the book, she is called Elizabeth, a name almost certainly inspired by Lawrence. And the head curator is called Ella, who is a stand-in for Stella Blum. So Jordi embraced science, or at least the concept and language of science. Perhaps her biggest legacy is a very large, heavy, and expensive ultrasonic wet cleaning table she purchased. Ultrasonic cleaning, which uses the physical properties of ultrasound to break soiling apart, is a very complex procedure that is still experimental even today. So in her book, she recounts a hilarious story of her falling into a hypnotic state upon first seeing the beauty and possibility of the table. Yet, in reality, Jerdy possibly used it unwisely, achieving great cleaning results, but to the detriment of objects since ultrasonic cavitation can blow fibers apart because they are um, very fragile. So in essence, the ultrasonic cleaning was effective, but too strong for the fragile historic fibers. It seems that Jerdy might have let her enthusiasm for a scientific device prevail over registering the actual scientific outcomes of the method. You know, but Jordi was onto something. She recognized that even without a scientific degree, by the 1980s, cons conservators needed to do science. We needed to at least appear scientific. And Betty Kirk argues that the scientific turn that occurred in conservation during this time disregarded Lawrence's intuitive approach, which was based on empiricism, embodied knowledge and craftsmanship. And indeed, the scientific turn in conservation has done much to discredit and diminish the groundbreaking advances that the Costume Institute's female staff members pioneered. By the 1980s, warnings about the dangers of conservation were growing, especially by historians and scholars who criticized the Costume, Institute to, Costume Institute's approach of presenting costume with as much life as one could give it. Lawrence's intuitive approach fell out of favor as science, preventive conservation, and the conservative and passive act of doing nothing gained influence. And here I have a quote by one of the most important fashion historians, Janet Arnold. And we find this shift even in Stella Blum's words. In 1980, she told the audience at the annual ICOM meeting, quote, the most important things in the preservation of costumes every woman knows. We wear clothes, and most of us are aware of the do's and don'ts of clothing care. It's just good housekeeping, end quote. And yet, by 1983, the year after Lawrence had died, she stated to the New York Times, quote, our techniques for the conservation and restoration of costumes are scientific. It is no longer housekeeping, end quote. So I titled this talk, The Intuitive Approach, after Kirk's article, because it's the emphasis on common sense hands-on experience and knowing one's limits that defines the early conservation efforts at the Costume Institute. Polar Weissman set the standard for balanced collection access and safe storage, while Liz Lawrence and Stella Blum pioneered compelling costume mounting and conservation techniques. Most importantly, they respected scientific conservation knowledge and looked towards outside experts when they needed help. So I hope that this history of cons conservation at the Costume Institute inspires us to acknowledge and respect the hard work and remarkable intuition of those pioneers who came before us. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, open up the chat. And I'm happy to take questions. Hi, Chris. Um, all right. I've not seen any questions, but if anybody wants to pop them in the chat or just raise your hand and I'll call and I'll repeat it for everybody. Yeah, hi. There is no such thing as a stupid question. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, so for all of you out there in Zoom land, the question was, I've come to the Cleveland Museum of Art. They don't have a costume collection. Are we looking to expand? And um, just so you know, we actually also have a fashion curator that we've hired, Darnell Lisby. Um, and we are not looking to collect costume. Um, we think Kent State and the Western Reserve Historical Society do that really, really well. 
we are looking to display costume in innovative ways that um, really pair fashion against the amazing collection that um, Cleveland has. So that was a great question. Yeah. Yep. So the question is, so would we borrow? Yes, we um, to generate fashion exhibitions. Yes, that means we have to borrow rather than use our own collection. Although I will say um, it hasn't come out yet, but the next exhibition or the first exhibition that Darnell will be doing is where he's borrowing some costume, but there's a lot of really amazing um, artifacts in the Cleveland Art uh, Museum of Arts collection that he'll be using. But um, I do miss working in a costume collection. And so um, when I came here, it was really exciting to be able to just go into the collection storeroom with Sarah Hume. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I could. OK. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So for you out there in Zoom land, the question was, I had posted a statement um, by Janet Arnold that if it has been cleaned or restored, it can cease to be a historic document. Do I believe with that? Um, no, I don't believe that fundamentally. But I, I do think that um, you have to be really careful when you conserve and clean things, that that has to be part of the consideration because Cleaning is a, a non-reversible process, so you are removing soiling that could potentially have an important thing. And the same with um, the conservation treatment, which is why you document it. But also, this is why conservators don't work in a vacuum. We um, are deeply um, connected with our colleagues, and we consult them when, when we need to. Um, but I, I do wonder if that statement was in response to Costume Institute stuff. And Jean, hi, Jean. Hi. I think Janet's concern at that moment uh, had as much to do with paper conservation as costume conservation. Because she had seen a number of uh, portraits um, where the, the figure was wearing a rug. And when she first saw the figure, uh, first saw the painting, the rug was colored. It was a pale pink or pastel. And in the painting process, that color disappeared. And so she, at the, uh, at the latter part of her experience of her career, especially as she was doing the patterns of fashion for love, she was very conscious of what happens when you, when you clean something. Right, that's great. And I hope, most, I'm sorry, I'm not going to repeat all of it <laughs> to out there, but um, Jean just dropped some great knowledge that. Um, Janet Arnold was really concerned about what can happen when cleaning. And it's not just with costume conservation, but also with painting conservation as well. Um, any other questions? There are a few in the chat um, I might just pull up. Um, and then I'll get to you in a sec. Um, sorry, where is the, there we go. Um, so somebody did have a quote that Judy, um, Judith Jordy redesigned the storage for the costume collection at the Minnesota Historical Society and did initial conservation of several important garments. And she recognized the potential of this collection. And that's really wonderful. This is by um, Linda Mashanik. And I'd love to maybe get in touch with you, Linda, to find out more about Judith so that I can accurately represent her legacy. Um, and then there was um, another question. Um, the argument you are laying out is really fascinating. Can you talk more about the scope of the project? Um, so this is. Uh, just a part of a chapter of my dissertation, which my dissertation focuses primarily on the um, training, the educate, the growth and educational opportunities and networks for textile conservators, primarily from the 60s through the 80s. And um, that's about all I'm going to say now. I'm, I'm in the middle of writing some papers, and I'll be publishing a bit on that. And then um, I just have to get my dissertation done at this point. <laughs> Um, which will happen hopefully within the year. And I'm just going to go back to the audience. Hi, you, did you have another question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. When did they make the decision to Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So the question um, was essentially, what is our decision making process? When do we decide to restore things? When do we decide to leave it alone? And I hate to give this answer. It's such a common conservation answer, but the answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> And what it, what it means um, is that it, it really depends on, um, and there's, there's a quote in here, that um, how much time do you have, how much skill level do you have, how much budget, the resources, um, how much scientific knowledge do you have, how certain are you of what it actually looked like, um, and then what's the goal of the treatment? Is it just to get it on a mannequin so that you can photograph it, or is it, you know, to just have it be studied or is it to put it on exhibition? And if it's on exhibition, does it have to be shown in a specific way? And all of those considerations kind of, you know, accumulate for a conservator to decide what they're going to do. I do want to stress that conservators don't decide what they're doing just by themselves. Um, at least they, they will have initial discussions. They are definitely deciding what they're doing in the moment when they're working on the treatment. But um, there's a lot of discussion and collaboration that goes into conservation treatments. That was a great question. Um, you have another one. I'm going to go back to the, the Zoom. That's no problem. Um, so I'm just going down. Um, OK, uh, Sarah Rogers asks, can I address my stance on the Kim Kardashian fiasco or, or direct folks to the Dressed podcast? I'll direct you to the Dressed podcast. So if you know that um, there's a great podcast called Dressed, A History of Fashion. And um, they're really, really great episodes of a whole bunch of really interesting people that are doing wonderful work in the field. Um, and I do have, there's a whole episode on what I think about the Kim Kardashian thing. I will be giving the annual lecture for the Institute of Conservation on December 1st. It's $10 for non-members. So the Institute for Conservation is the UK um, organization, conservation organization, it's called ICON. And so I'll be talking a little bit more about my thought process and how conservation can react to viral moments like that um, in a good way. Um, and I'm just going to see if there's anything else. All right, let's go back. What, what's your other question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so for the treatments there, the goal was almost certainly the curators wanted it on display and the conservators had to figure it out. And there are certain known fabrics in costume that are um, that you just know are going to be a problem. And one is silk net. Um, and in fact, I was just walking through the wedding exhibition that Sarah Hume put on and I was looking at some of the veils and I was like, oh my gosh, they're in such great condition. Don't tell me those are real. And <laughs> she's like, well, they're old, but not real. You know, they're, they're not the authentic original ones. So um, there are certain things, um, black silk from the late, eight, uh, late 19th and early 20th century also has problems. So yeah, weighted silk, exactly. Are there any other questions? Um, I don't, I think I got every, um, and thank you all for, for joining. Um, oh, there was a question up here that says, is the top tier of the hanger, is it for the shoulders and the lower tier is for supporting the skirt? Yes, exactly. It's a full body hanger um, with the pole that is long enough to the floor that you can actually just slot it into like a flange on a, a board. And you can, you can actually adjust the location of where the, um, kind of hip flanges are and where the shoulder flanges are so that you get the proportions right. So it was a really, really innovative design at the time. Um, although the issues that Stella Blum called out with it being a little bit sharp and rigid um, definitely were problems that we noticed even now. Any other questions? Uh, looks like. Thank you. Any Anybody else? You know, it was a a long talk, but I'm always happy. Thank you all for coming and thank you there out there.
Yes, and I wanted to thank you. And I also want to make sure I thank um, Dr. Christopher okay. Sullivan, who has supported this lecture series, um, and Jean Grusto, for whom this lecture series is, um, oh, I realize you can't see me, yeah. um, so, um, for whom this lecture series is, um, is uh, dedicated. Um, so thank you so much for everyone who joined us in person and for all of you. Oh my gosh, look at all these Zoom people, it's great. Um, so thank you so, and thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming to um, tonight. Oh, my pleasure.